Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all tonight to our Hammer Conversation with James Hanahan and Jonathan Leatham. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and I also want to quickly mention some upcoming Hammer literary programs that you might be interested in. This Thursday, the celebrated poet and former poet laureate Robert Pinsky will read from his recently published memoir, as well as new poems that are as of yet unpublished. On Friday, February 17th, Hilton Alls will be here speaking in dialogue with Jennifer Krasinski. And then on February 23rd, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Vijay Sishradi will be reading here as well. I should also mention that we currently have an amazing exhibition up right now about the great writer Joan Didion, and it was curated by the great writer Hilton Alls. So that exhibition will be up for about two more weeks. I highly encourage you to come see it before it goes. As you can tell, we have a lot going on, so if you'd like to receive reminder emails about our upcoming programs, please sign up for our email list. Uh, we're gonna have a sign-up sheet by the books, or you can also find out more and sign up on our website. So now I'd like to introduce this evening's wonderful writers. James Hanahan is an artist and writer who was born in the Bronx, grew up in Yonkers, and now lives in Brooklyn. His first novel, God Says No, was honored by the American Library Association's Stonewall Book Award. His second novel, Delicious Foods, won the Penn Faulkner and the Hurston Wright Legacy Awards. His short stories have been published in Fence, Story Quarterly, and Bomb. For many years, he was a writer for the Village Voice and Salon. He's also a visual and performance artist and studied art as an undergraduate at Yale. He's one of the founders of the New York performance group Elevator Repair Service and worked with them for 10 years. He's exhibited text-based visual art at the Center for Emerging Visual Artists in Philadelphia and at the 490 Atlantic Main Street Arts and James Cohan Galleries. And he also published a book combining his talents in prose, poetry, and images called Pilot Imposter. He lives in Brooklyn where he teaches writing at the Pratt Institute. James's newest book is called Didn't Nobody Give a Shit What Happened to Carlotta? And it is wonderful. The main character, Carlotta, is someone I feel like I know so well. She's a really fully formed real person in my brain. She's a trans woman who's just been released from prison on parole for a crime she didn't commit. Like Homer's Odyssey and James Joyce's Ulysses, the novel follows Carlotta's circuitous journey from prison to reconnecting with her large extended family, her ex-wife, and her estranged son. Brooklyn is also a major character in the book, like Dublin is for Ulysses. And as a writer, uh, as a reader, <laughs> I'm so not a writer, accompanying Carlotta on her journey through, throughout Brooklyn, you cannot help but build a lot of understanding for the sheer exasperating unfairness and total lack of support that so many people experience when they're re-entering the world after prison. Plus, she is straight up hilarious and an astute observer of human character. I just love her. But enough about Carlotta. Let's talk about Jonathan Lethem. Jonathan Lethem is the New York Times bestselling author of 12 novels, five, five short story collections, six books of nonfiction commentary, one collection of comics, a new book of poetry just out called Horse With No Cake, as well as innumerable brilliant essays, and he's considered one of the foremost novelists of today. He's written noir fiction, westerns, science fiction, graphic novels, literary criticism, and a lot about music, and I mean a lot. His novels include Chronic City, The Fortress of Solitude, Motherless Brooklyn, The Ecstasy of Influence, Dissident Gardens, The Feral Detective, and most recently, The Arrest. Motherless Brooklyn won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction, the McCallan Gold Dagger for Crime Fiction, and the Salon Book Award, and was named Book of the Year by Esquire. Somebody's phone is telling me to get off the stage. Um, in 2005, Lethem was awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant, and in 2011, he joined the faculty of Pomona College as a professor of creative writing. Like James Hanahan, Lethem began life as a visual artist and discovered when he was in college that he preferred writing. But since then, he's written fiction and or done several collaborations with visual artists, including Julian Hover, who's in the audience today, Michael Crudson, and Raymond Pettibone. James and Jonathan know each other from past writers' events and share much in common, including a serious involvement in the art world with poetry, with prose, and with Brooklyn. So tonight, after James and Jonathan have a dialogue, they'll take some audience questions, and then I'd like to invite you all to join us for some light refreshments, and they'll be happy to sign some books for you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming James Hanneman and Jonathan Leatham.
Thanks, Claudia. That was great. I like that poetry, prose, and Brooklyn are different genres. <laughs> so I'm Jonathan, he's James. And um, why don't we start with the fun story of how we became acquainted? Um, because we do have all these uh, resonances in, in what we do and think about and how we, our, our origin right. stories, but we didn't always know each other. Claudia made it seem as if it was inevitable, inevitable though. Yeah, I think it was inevitable, was like, but the way it actually happened is pretty good. They are basically, you know, you're my older brother. <laughs> so, um, in, um, uh, well, I know what year it was, 1999, mm -hmm. um, we were both in residence at the artist colony Yaddo um, at the end of the fall season. And we it was both pretty had, much the winter, right? It was like yeah, we had, into fall it was December, and, was, and we had residencies yeah. that went through uh, to, the new year, through the new year. So that was Y two K. So we spent Y two K together, and um, Yaddo was an interesting place to be for that because if you were doing visualizations about like where you would want to be if society melted down, a kind of walled, fortressy kind of space with its own independent generator and kitchen and and like a, it seemed kind of we, good in a way. We kept joking that everybody was gonna have to get that, weapons and right. like protect but the then again, perimeters our, of the our, place. Our group was a group of artists, so we were so, we, we had this like, and it was Cher a smaller group. Cherry because it defensive was the position, but we had no one who was capable of defending <laughs> our cherry defensive position. So we were sure to be the nearby survivalists were sure to have their eye on this fortress that we were inhabiting, <laughs> and we were going to roll over for them really easily. That was our theory. Um, but fortunately, <laughs> all that happened was a dance party. <laughs> and the, yeah, that was that was what everyone was afraid was going to happen that, <laughs> before Y two K, and there there it was. Um, but I was actually also told to look out for you when I, before I went there. That was my first time there, and it was very odd, um, because the only person I knew there who was not, well, I mean, I didn't know you at the time, actually. The only person I knew there was Tom Beller. Oh, yeah. And this was right after um, uh, Robert Bingham had passed away, mm -hmm. and he was in a very strange mood. He was... He was brooding around the woods. And I didn't actually know yet <laughs> why that was. And then I was reading the Times one morning, and I saw this, this article, and I was like, oh. Um, anyway, there was, a, there was also a kind of lot of, like, young male novelist energy. And I was writing a, a book that never got found a publisher. <laughs> I didn't, although I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> As happens sometimes in those projects. Um, and I, I remember that the thing that kind of, there was a lot of Bob Dylan trivia being thrown around between you and Tom Piazza, Oh God! I think. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, so and I'm going to, I'm going to try stop to me from move, move, going move past that <laughs> quickly and say the next time we got to see each other, it, it was a few years before we met again and it was in Austin, Texas. And then again, it was in Austin, Texas. And I was just thinking about this when I saw you in LA, where I've also seen you a couple of times, that we may never have been together in Brooklyn. We, we, we meet anywhere except Brooklyn. That, I mean, I guess that's one of those things that now that you've noticed it, it's gonna be a rule. So, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say like, don't ever come to my house. <laughs> you know, like, Cause that would be stupid, but I mean, it seems, maybe, maybe the idea should be like, now we should. Now, yeah. I invite you. Yeah. The phenomenon. Everybody, every. <laughs> once, once the phenomenon is recorded, it's it can be, we can let go of it. Yeah. So, but um, you just wrote a a, a a a great Brooklyn novel, and it's really a a a, a book of the, um, not just the idea loosely of you know Brooklyn is interesting right. and cool and it's a place, but of. Uh, specific precinct streets, the sort of houses. A, the it's sort like, of Abel Ferrara idea. Yeah, it's it's your like, your 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 the feet of the book are on the ground of or on the on right. the sidewalk. I mean, it's both James Joyce and Abel Ferrara, right? Yeah. It's like 
You know, because the, the thing, the thing, you know what I'm talking about. I think yeah. I know you know. I think that's one of, one of the things that might be a little bit of a problem in this conversation. Too much shorthand. Is that, like, yeah. there's, there yeah. is too much shorthand. Yeah. So what? So but Jake. Like, so what, tell the people what you mean by Abel Ferrara. <laughs> well, in an Abel Ferrara's movies, when they're set in New York, if, and you're from New York, if you watch them. You, you know that when people move from one place to another, it's a logical move. It's never like, okay, now they're on the Upper West Side. When they, now, they're in the, you know, now they're in Greenwich Village. Now they're it's in the Brooklyn. opposite of Rocky's famous yeah. run through Philadelphia, which if you, <laughs> apparently if you put it in order of the landmarks in Philadelphia that he passes, it's like a 375-mile <laughs> circuit. Um, yeah, no, in, in, um, in James's book, if you know Fort Greene, you spend some time in Fort Greene. Yeah, uh, hyper locality is one of the words somebody used to describe yeah. what was going on in it. That's great. Um, um, so I, I've got my like my big question for you about this book is um, that it it's a a book about coping with transformation or not or not or <laughs> right uh, grappling better word. Uh, with transformation, and there's a double. Carlotta is not who she once was, and Brooklyn is not what but Carlotta knew it to be. It, yeah. Or, yeah it's so, not. so there's a metaphor or a or a, 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 like a, a doubling, a doubling, but it's a really interesting one because it's a trans gentrification. <laughs> Have you been saving that? Yes, of course. I told God. you don't spend it all in the green room. I, of course, I've got <laughs> things saved. Yeah. But that wasn't a question. You're right. I didn't, <laughs> so put it, now, I didn't put it in the form. So now, of, how about that big I question? Didn't, you I didn't said put it in the form of a question. At what point did you um, understand that this doubling was was the design of the book? Or oh, it's a doubling like Dublin. It's a Dublin. Uh. <laughs> it's gonna get crazy. Yeah, it's, it's getting good now. Super nerdy. Yeah. Um, when did I realize yeah, that that what, was what? I, when did you embrace that? That. Um, I mean, I hard, I really should have written all this down because you know most of what happens is just a kind of like, you know, you're you're sort of working on something and you just add another piece to it, and I should like really mark down the dates at which I was like. But then there's so many things that like kind of get lost at the same time. But at a certain point. I think it was after um, I had decided that I was going to make, um, I was going to use uh, Joyce as a, uh, I guess I was going to like cannibalize Joyce a little bit. Um, I realized, and one of the decisions I made was that, you know, most of the middle of the book was going to take place on one day, not unlike Ulysses. A lot of the things I did were structural instead of, you know, just like lifting you know, characters or things, because I felt like there were a lot of things about her uh, Carlotta story that were already sort of echoing mm -hmm. um, the Joyce. Well, but also um, the the actual Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. And it and right. it goes it goes through Joyce back to the Greek, including the place names in upstate New York. Right. Which are all suddenly you realize it's it, it is sort of the Odyssey when you the prison system. In, right. in New York State is all in, in, in places that, islands that Ulysses had to escape from. Right, you're, des you're describing sort of the opposite of my process, mm -hmm. which is great because you read it and I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> but what, ha what happened was I wanted to write this book about you know, how Brooklyn has changed because I have a very long history of Fort Greene. My, uh, my grandfather bought a, a brownstone there in like the 50s for $11,000. And two of my cousins on my father's side still live in that house, um, and I teach at Pratt. And you know, I walk pretty much past that, and I think about like my father being somewhere, you know, in the past, wandering around. Well, probably not wandering around. Probably going to do something nefarious. I mean, that's something we have <laughs> we have so in common is just a, a a ground level record in a neighborhood that has become overwhelmingly different than. You know, yes. Than when it was uh, when um, the house cost eleven thousand dollars. Yeah. So I mean, I wanted to write about how much it, the the place has changed over the last you know over my lifetime, which is a little more than fifty years. Um, so, but I I I realized okay, well, 
it's interesting to me, but how can I find a character um, to whom it would be a revelation and for whom you know it would be fun for other people to see through their eyes? And I thought, well, somebody who's missed it would be a good option. And then it was like, well, why would they have missed it? Oh, maybe they were in prison. And that gave me the opportunity to think about you know, the carceral system and all of the horrible things that it has done to uh, lots of different kinds of people, but people of color disproportionately. Um, and then also you know, queer people. Um, and I, it was, there was a little bit of like sort of inserting myself into that situation and like trying to figure out like, well, where would, where would I be if I were in, in that um, situation. And that's when I realized that writing about somebody coming back from upstate New York is like writing, um, rewriting the Odyssey because of the New York military, central military, the central New York military tract, which is, right. do, you, Tell the, you have you to, you have to explain that. that. I know. It's, it's even like, more I feel important like I, have to, I don't have to explain Ferrara. anything I, to you. I know that, but you should, but, that's a great story. But though. the people, yeah. everyone else doesn't know the yeah. things you know. It's, it's like talking Tell to the, the Wizard of Oz or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe less, less not, not a fraud, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a non-fraud. And my head is smaller. A sort of, I'll think of the metaphor later. You, pro you could probably come up with a much better metaphor, actually. I'll work on so that. Uh, tell the that people about the you. system. Um, after the Revolutionary War, uh, when uh, the, they were giving out land, <clears throat> um, which of course did not really belong to them, but that's another uh, story, um, to uh, soldiers of the Revolutionary War. Um, there was a guy in the office that was charged with this named Robert Harper, um, who was a classical literature buff. And he decided that he was going to name at least 28 of the municipalities. They were all kind of like square parcels of land really large square parcels of land in upstate New York. He decided he was gonna name all of them after classical literature references. Um, and I think that not only did that happen, but it caught on as like a thing that they there did. Are more, I think there are more than just his yeah. original, yeah, Troy and Ithaca, Ithaca and... and uh, I mean, on the east side of Seneca alone, yeah, there's, Seneca, right, there's yeah. Hector, yeah. Um, Romulus, Ovid. <laughs> There's just like a ton of them, and Utica even sounds like it, but I don't think actually is. Is it? No. You would know. I don't know. <gasps> you don't know. Stump the wizard. <laughs> um, so okay, so uh, the place that I came in, in my experience, you know, my uh, my experience of you writing this book was when you were looking to uh, kind of authenticate or research some of your um, information about uh, prison. Oh, right, right. So, and I know that I, I ended up steering you, uh, I, I gave you a, a bum steer, something that didn't help. Mm -hmm. But what, what did help? What worked? What worked? For getting yourself into a place where you were comfortable projecting Carlotta's experience inside well, uh, my my tendency in when i research is to read and just kind of absorb and think pretty hard about you know where i would be if i were to be in a real situation of the kind that is described um and a, a, there was a a fellow who, who a, a couple of different people who had had upstate new york prison experiences who um who uh, read through the manuscript after that and because I was on the, I was in the process of looking for people, and there were a lot of people who like ghosted me, or you know, were either not interested or the, whatever. But the, the there were some people who the did. The Venn actually. diagram of of people who would be able to read this book capably, and who you could find, and who were <laughs> going to be able to, to to add to your perspective. Carlotta is, is probably. Unique. <laughs> It turns kind out. Kind of small. Yeah, I mean, I at a certain point I was like, if only I could get the main character, yeah. if only if I could get Carlotta herself to authenticate well, but, what right. I've written. I mean, this is a this is a thing that happens in in when you when you uh, go on a search as a novelist. Eventually, you come back to I'm going to have to find a way to 
pull this out of myself and, right. and make it okay between me and myself because there's no one who can help me in, in some zone of the work. There's always going to be this thing where it's just like, you have to go out on your own limb and, yeah. and, 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 you know, be there. But at the same time, there were definite, like, you know, things that I wanted to make sure I got right, like, especially... Well, but that's how you get to that place, right? Yeah. I mean, it was a very deliberate strategy of, like, thinking about how slang and jargon create the worlds of prison and um, the, the um, legal system around it. And, you know, the, uh, everybody has their own, like, slang. Like, slang changes from prison to prison. The lawyers have their own way of talking. Like, the correctional officers have their own way of talking. It's like just this gigantic ball of slang. And, you know, the way that I feel about the, the way we use slang in this country um, is that, you know, exactly what, sort of what you were talking about. Like, as, as if you can talk the talk, you're in, basically, right? Like, if you know, if you know how to say the things that people who are involved in whatever community it is say those things, like you are suddenly a member of that community. You could be a huge imposter, but you know maybe you'll be found out at some point. But that's kind of how things work. And I feel like there's not, and there are not enough people who are writing things in this country who are reflecting how messed up the things we do with language are. Like we're in like the age like the golden age of terrible prose. Every day we are on the internet and like terrible prose is like falling down upon us like rain and yet we're not seeing it in our literature. <laughs> and this, so here, here this, is my contribution you've done it. to terrible prose. <laughs> you put it between hardcovers for time immemorial. Um, I mean, the, of course this points to a direction I'm I'm scared to go, which is to talk about uh, what scared. chat AI and the generation oh. of, <laughs> of new kinds of bad prose. But um, will you read? Will you read a little bit from Carolina? Uh, yeah, for the people. Sure. Thank you. Um, I will. Thank you. Um, I just put... I'll just read a little from the beginning to give you a little flavor. Two decades and change into her beef, Carlotta Mercedes braced herself for audition number five with the New York State Board of Parole. She knew her many years in the shoe, 23-7 with no TV, no radio, no books, and no good touch, would probably blow her case this time too. With so many box hits, she couldn't finish any of the A&D programs the knuckleheads like to see. But solitary overkill wasn't the worst of her shots. Them son of a bitches said I had bad behavior, but they definition of bad behavior is if you scream when a CO whooping your ass like a Betty Crocker fudge cake. Why did she keep getting hit? Sometimes she thought her case grossed out the panel. Other times she blamed her mini beefs, the LOMs, the LOCs, the LORs, the LOVs. She knew the bosses were pretty much Klansmen. And at some point she always went apeshit. Those motherfuckers better let me out this time, she told Frenzy, the new man she was riding with, out in the yard the day she heard. Who is they to judge my ass? Shut up, bitch, he soothed. You think you special? Don't expect nothing. You got nothing coming. Her eyes rolled behind her lids, and she whacked her arms closed. I have been had known not to expect nothing forever by this time. Fifty million motherfuckers already done, done told me how much nothing I got coming. So let's see it. Where am I nothing at? And who's more special than I is? Her tongue had slipped a little out of fear that he didn't really have eyes for her, or big enough ones anyway. She felt like some kind of monkey mouth even before she'd shut her trap. If you want out, you better learn to talk right, Frenzy said, flashing a dimple. Folks be talking proper out there. Oh yeah, since when? She gave him face and flipped her hair so it grazed his nose. In 1993, Carlotta's cousin Caffelli had shot some old lady who sold little bottles of Thunderbird to the skulls of bed and put her to sleep for a month. Carlotta was in attendance, showing off her talent for bad timing. The lady woke up again, but the bullet lowered her IQ to a chimpanzee's, and she could hardly brush her own teeth anymore. 
Kathy landed in Attica doing all day and a night. Mama must have stopped saving his supper. Carlotta turned state's evidence and still got 12 and a half to 22. The public defender called that getting off with a reduced sentence. But to Carlotta, that didn't sound like getting off in any way, shape, or form. The robbery or the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon could have gotten you 25 each, the judge whined. You're lucky to be doing them concurrently. That's luck, then fuck luck. Okay, so that's great. A little taste. We should talk about, I mean, now that the sound of it is in people's ears, we should talk about um, vocal writing. You're also a performer. Sometimes. And that... Sort of an erstwhile performer. That voice, I've heard you do it <laughs> as a riff, and it's not Carlotta, it's somebody else. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was always Carlotta. Yeah? I don't know. Who knows? I mean, the other book is kind of about, you know, fragmented selves, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I do plenty of code switching. I mean, I feel like I turn code switching into a kind of performance, right? That's like not necessarily a chore. There's, I feel like there's sort of a, a, a feeling that code switching is actually something, sometimes, everybody except for Sarah Jones maybe, is like, <laughs> talks about code switching as if it isn't a pleasure to be able to kind of, you know, move between worlds and, right. you know, talk to different people in different ways and like, um, there's just always, except when it's awkward. <laughs> That's the only time that I don't particularly well, like, I, like I, that idea. But I think when you talk about taking the, the friction out of it or the, um, the labor out of it, yeah. it's about embracing the awkwardness, like mm. turning it inside out. Right, right. Um, so do you want to talk about that more? Should we make our, our big pivot here? Because you alluded to the other book. And, I did, I know. And so <laughs> um, the, the pilot. I'm, I'm kind of letting you lead. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> um, pilot imposter, I'm going to wave it around um, to signify our, our big pivot, is is James' rendition of uh, Fernando Pessoa. And, and I'm going to let you uh, all right, we'll talk unpack, about it unpack that. You alluded okay. to it already, but Pessoa was a writer who it was threw, a, threw his voice. Uh, he, he did a kind of super ventriloquism uh, act. Yeah, a, a Portuguese writer from the early part of the 20th century um, who was writing who, in a way that people um, have seized upon now as a sort of, you know, that he was ahead of his time. He was, um, he had kind of decided that there weren't enough Portuguese poets, and he decided to create a bunch of them. So there's something like 70, I think it's debatable how many different alter egos he, he created, and they're called, he called them heteronyms. Um, and it wasn't just that they were alter egos, it was that they, they had relationships, they were, um, they edited one another, they had like ideological fights. There's and, ri rivals among them, mm -hmm. and yeah, and they all and had there biographies. Was, there was one who was like the guru that they all looked to as you know the master poet. But that guru wasn't named Pessoa. No, that was um, is uh, uh, no, it wasn't Reyes. It was uh, what's the other uh, Alberto Cairo. Yeah, right. So, so how does how does your excitement about Pessoa? turn into this book about airline disasters? Um, well, the book's about a lot of things. <laughs> it just sort of, all right. Another long story. So what happened was, um, uh, my husband and I, right after the 2016 election, whose fate we'll, we will not mention, <laughs> um, we, were, we went to... Uh, Cape Verde and to Lisbon, because you kind of sometimes have a stopover in Lisbon when you fly to Cape Verde. And we decided to stop in Lisbon for a few days on the way back. And whenever I go to a new place, I bring a representative work of literature from that place, like you know something written by somebody from there, usually. Um, 
rather than a diaspora kind of book. Um, and I'd, I'd finished the book uh, by the Cape Verdean author, um, Almeida, I think is his name. Um, because it was relatively short. It has a really long, really long title that I always forget, like screw up. But um, it was pretty short and funny, and I, I didn't have any beef with it. Um, so I, I started reading Pessoa on the plane to Lisbon. And um, this was, remember the context, right? So upset about various people who didn't necessarily um, have experience um, being uh, put into positions of great power and responsibility and probably uh, being about to fuck it up. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, the first line of this book, I was reading this uh, anthology by uh, Richard, uh, uh, translated by Richard Zenith called Pessoa and Company, and it's kind of a, a smorgasbord of, of the heteronyms, like the more important it's ones. It's an anthology of of different writers who are all Pessoa. Oh, exactly. Um, and the f but the first one is Cairo, who's a, a kind of semi-naive type. We're like, he's, he's, he, uh, the, the, uh, the analogy I always make is that he's kind of like Chauncey Gardner from, from being there. He's like, you know, the poet who's anti-poetic in a lot of ways. And just, he's just a simple guy who sees things and says that this, the surface is, is the truth which is like anathema to me. What? The surface is the truth. Um, so the first line of that book is, um, as he translated it, I've never kept sheep, but it's as if I did. And that, <laughs> that made me so crazy at that moment. I was like, you're lying on your resume already. <laughs> and then I, as I read more of Caro's work, I was just struck by how much I disagreed with like fundamentally with his worldview, and I, you know, and I was uh, somebody had already made some comedian had already said something about how like electing you know who was like was like you know uh, hiring a plumber who didn't have any experience either like would you or an airline pilot who didn't have any experience so and I'm I'm whenever I fly him I always think I think maybe maybe not everybody thinks about this but I always think about how vulnerable I am how I haven't met the people in the cockpit. <laughs> Who are those people? And yet there's this, I'm just like trusting some idea about a company, a trust that I have for this, oh, this industry. I mean, in 2017, there were no fatalities actually in commercial aviation, I think. Um, somebody should probably check that. But, <laughs> but they, were, they were very proud of that, yeah. Uh, in commercial aviation. Um, so by the time the, um, the trip was over, um, I had decided that I was going to write a book in which I responded to every last poem in the Pessoa anthology. And as if to, um, to confirm that decision, um, we had rented a car, and we w when we went to the car rental agency, the, uh, the woman behind the desk had a nameplate on that said, Pessoa. And <laughs> at first I was like, oh, that, it must be a pretty common name in, in Portugal. I mean, you know. So I struck up a little conversation. I was like, is that, is that a common name in Portugal? She was like, no. <laughs> so that gave me an opening to talk about Pessoa. And I, I was like, oh, well, um, do you think you might be, you know, and she's like, I don't know if I'm related to him, but I love his work. <laughs> okay, so um, excellent story. It skates right over a decision that I want to back up and look at, which is um, one I made myself. We're mm -hmm. both novelists who are suddenly willing to do other admit things. that we write a poem, you know, there are, or to try to write a poem. Or to publish a poem, but you're like I feel like like me, you're one of those people who like appears to be a novelist, and yet when you peel back the layers, there's more, much more to it. Well, Claudia, I had always suspected you. In fact, before I read yeah. um, Horse with No Cake, I had always suspected you of being an, another member of They Might Be Giants. <laughs> And I think it turned out to be, I think I was right. 
I, I had an accidental collaboration with John Linnell. Yes, in that's a, what in I'm a, referring in a backyard, to. Actually. In a backyard in Williamsburg, um, <laughs> which is part of part of this this little book. But um, uh, okay, so you mentioned code switching. Do you mm -hmm. associate it with that? Do you feel? Do you feel? Do you feel like you're playing with a disguise or a or or throwing your voice or or in writing these poems? Are you just opening up a new? Well, I didn't. I didn't really want to respond to Pessoa like by imitating him. Mm -hmm. So instead of worrying about like creating personas, what I did was I just didn't think about what category I was going to respond in, and so I just would like read a poem and then think about how I wanted to respond, and then you know write whatever it happened to be. If it happened to be a poem, fine. If it was like a sort of semi nonfiction piece, great. If it was, you know, a prose poem, if it was just a joke, like if it was a concrete poem, it, I was just, it's all good. But in that way, I was sort of act, trying to echo, you know, faintly, like his project. Have you gone on writing poems since Pilot Imposter, or was it an enclosed uh, um, gesture? A little bit. I, th I think, you know, I've, Pilot Imposter is, is, I have always been kind of tinkering with things like it. Mm -hmm. um, I have like a whole file in my on my laptop of things like that, as it seems you yeah, do. Well, my book is that file. <laughs> it's just every poem I ever tried to write and got to the end of, starting at age nineteen. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I mean, it's actually a book that, as scant and kind of, you know, self. Mocking as it is, it's a, it's a, it's like five decades of writing. Wow. Um, I've recently published a, a poem-like thing um, that I think you would actually you would actually find amusing. Um, but it was partially because I had the, this title kind of you know sitting around, which was "The Negro Speaks of Rivers Cuomo." <laughs> yeah. Sometimes just, the title forces you to. I to felt make something. like I kind of had to it's do like that. It's like that that movie pitch about the mime that I'm working on. Right. <laughs> the mime runs for president, and and it, it was just a stupid joke until I realized it, it could be called the glass ceiling, and then I, I'm stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> but we've decided it's it's going to be a woman president. Yes. Yeah. Could, just to echo yeah. glass ceiling. If anybody else has ideas for that, <laughs> <laughs> we, we can we can all workshop this mime movie together. Um, the writer's room. <laughs> the audience <laughs> becomes a writer's room. Um, so, um, so uh, do you want to read a, a poem? Do you want or or a something from do Pilot Imposter? Do you want to read a poem? I can do it too. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. I don't. You, I feel like you're making. Is it my turn? They're making this all about me. <laughs> I think it's about you too, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Oh wait, I just switched codes again, didn't I? That was weird. <laughs> I don't know what I would read though. This is. I, I think this is the moment at which we start inviting chaos into the it, it, into the room. You want me to bit. go first? Oh yeah, go okay, ahead. I'll sure. do that. So um, I mean, I'm going to read. Uh, so a, a lot of the the poems are appropriations of things, and I mean, I should say it's also got song lyrics in it because I. Did don't you bother to get permissions from who? Oh mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think I'm very interested in permissions. Um, I, I have a whole manifesto about how it's okay to appropriate. Oh, of course. So I, oh. I would be, it would be very mediocre of just, me to go I around just, asking for permission. I just that. recommended that to a student who yeah. was concerned about so, um, stealing. So maybe out loud, it would, it would be good to... Um, oh, this is like a Wizard of Oz act now. I'm going to show you behind the curtain, and then I'm going to put the big Oz head back on. Um, so this first... Poem I'm going to read. Your, is, your slippers are almost ruby. Yeah, and I've got the ruby slippers. These are pink chucks. <laughs> um, this first poem is called called Likes, and it's um, it's a list poem, but it's also all appropriations. And um, the, let's see, the people appropriated in this poem Likes are LCD sound system, losing my edge, faith no more, we care a lot, the hair soundtrack, ain't got no. Um, the songwriters of These Foolish Things, Strachey and Link. Rodgers and Hammerstein, my favorite things. The Nails, 88 lines about 44 women. 
Ian Jury, Reasons to be Cheerful, Part 3, and Pink Floyd's Eclipse. So this is Likes. It's kind of the poem as listical, I guess. Popeye, Botticelli, Girl by the Whirlpool, All That You Touch, Hot Tamale, Ovaltine, Every Great Song by the Beach Boys, All That You Taste, All the Modern Lovers tracks, Buddy Holly, The Moon Over May West's Shoulder, Marilyn Who Knew No Shame, Schnitzel with Noodles, Porridge Oats, I Ching, Tarot, my partner makes fun of me for the way I say tarot, but it's because that's how Ian Dury says it. He rhymes it with parrot in his song. I Ching, tarot, Buddha, Per Ubu, pill, Scott Walker, the juice of the carrot, a tinkling piano in the next apartment, the pants on a Roxy Usher, fires, Elvis and Scotty, muddy waters, toothpicks, shoelaces, sex, coffee, books, food, scissors, magazines, Hollywood, Tuesday Weld, sitting on the potty, all that you see, round or skinny bottoms, Zimmerman, Harpo, Groucho, and Chico, Brenda's strange obsession for certain vegetables and fruits, Strangers in a strange land, Stranger in a Strange Land, Cheddar Cheese and Pickle, England, Outer Space, Sun Ra, 10 CC, Eric B. and Rakim, Gil Scott Heron, The Slits, Slap and Tickle, Astronauts, Air, Whiskers on Kittens, John Coltrane's Soprano, Burton Taylor, Pop Art, Popcorn, Popsicle, Andy Warpop, Phoning Up a Buddy, Eloise, who played guitar and sang songs about whales and cops, Losers, a cigarette that bears a lipstick's, lipstick traces, lipstick's traces, a fairground's painted swings, the Colosseum, cellophane, the feet of Fred Astaire, the nose on the great Durante, transformers because there's more than meets the eye, the song that Crosby sings, all you feel, all you love. That's it. Thanks, thank you. Ian Jury also pronounces David's Devat's Isn't that <laughs> I did not know what he was saying for such a long time. Yeah. I think it was like genius, the website with all the lyrics on it that I was but, like, um, Davidson Motorcycle? <laughs> <laughs> motorcycle. What? But motorcycle has an antecedent or a, a denominator in Arlo Guthrie, who has that song, I don't want a pickle, I just want to ride on my motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The wizard sure, speaks. Sure. I, 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 um, sure. <laughs> okay. You, um, you go. Let me see. What, what could one read after that? Um, I don't think I have anything quite so elusive. Um, I could try to write, read the one written by the butterfly. Um, oh, this one, this one usually goes over well. It's called Air Disaster. A plane crashed under mysterious circumstances in a country with a dense, sparsely populated rainforest. None of the passengers or crew survived. Because of the nature of the accident, many parts of the plane had scattered over a wide area, which made this difficult, made this difficult investigation almost impossible. People from nearby villages walked away with parts of the plane they thought might be useful as tools or to trade. The small country did not have a good transportation safety board. They needed to send the many charred parts of the fuselage to the United States for analysis. After getting word to the local populace that they would pay a reward for the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, and providing pictures of both, officials recovered each of them. The boxes had sustained heavy fire damage. No one knew if they would yield any information. The investigators carefully packed the black boxes, which were orange, into crates and put them on an airplane to Washington, D.C. But the airplane carrying the black boxes disappeared from radar while over the ocean en route to the United States. There followed an extremely time-consuming and costly search and rescue effort for the black boxes on board the second plane, as well as for those from the earlier crash. The search continued for months and cost many millions of dollars. The governments conducting the search ran out of money twice and nearly gave up, but the families of those presumed dead insisted that the search continue and put pressure on the various governments involved. For a while, 
The press remained fixated on such an unusual story, but gradually, with so few developments, they lost interest. A year and a half into the search, investigators found the wreckage. The plane had sunk so far down that only a robotic submersible could explore the crash site. Alternatives existed, but their costs became prohibitive. Finally, after five years, the technology and budget came within reach, and the investig investigators recovered both flight data recorders and cockpit voice recorders. Everyone on the reconnaissance boat whooped with joy. That night, on the way back to shore, the boat caught fire and sank, killing all crew members. No one could ever properly investigate any of the mishaps. They all remain completely unexplained at the bottom of the ocean. That's what it's like to have to deal with you. surprise ending It's there. a great ending. <laughs> I knew it was coming, but it was still good. Um, OK, should we talk about our what we're, what we're yeah, up to? Yeah, I mean, that to? was a, the perversely we were talking about, about. Oh, wait, I shouldn't mention that we were talking about. Right? Is that, no, uh, you, you, you go. A, a while ago, we were talking about just talking about these two <laughs> books and disappointing everyone, or just wrestling or something, right? Where we just it was arm wrestle, and that was it. Well, I, I said that we if had we all didn't these it, conceptual ideas about if we didn't talk happen. about Carlotta, people might get really confused and think they'd come to the. the, the there's two. Place, there's right, two right. James Hanahams. I mean, there are. Yeah. There's more than two. <laughs> My God, the animals alone. But the other one isn't <laughs> appearing at another museum in Los Angeles tonight. Not to my knowledge. Um, but wait, there was a... You were saying. Buried in the, I was saying, um, what was I saying? That we had just... <laughs> <laughs> this, is what, this is what happens. Yes, this is what would happen, that we yeah. would end up talking about. So can you tell me a little... I mean, you've already sort of said this is all stuff that had... Um, well, no, I oh, wrote oh, a lot the, of... Oh, you know, oh, here's yeah. the thing that... that um, I was going to point out was that you had done something kind of Pessoa-ish in, in Horse With No Cake, which was to have created a poet, um, ha Harris, Con Harris Conklin. Conklin. Yeah. yeah, there's a suite of poems about the New York Mets written by a guy named Harris Conklin, who is my one heteronym. <laughs> and he's, um, he's a, a disappointed, uh, um, aging Mets fan. Because there aren't many of those. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and writes and compulsively writes poems about them uh, in this suite of poems uh, called the Poems of the Five Hundred Team. Um, it was in a period when the the Mets were they were they weren't even terrible enough to be the their sort of sentimental losing <laughs> Mets. They were sort of just like overpaid, underperforming. Uh, 500. But should I read a should I read a Mets poem then? Yeah, the, okay. but there's also another conceit that goes on with those, right? The well, he he has a, a a guy who he writes the poem. He sends the poems to, uh -huh. who's who's um, I can now say this. We've stopped hiding. Christopher Sorrentino, right. my friend, uh, the novelist Christopher Sorrentino, uh, had had a character too, and the two of them were writing letters to each other. And Conklin's poems all originally came about within this correspondence. So it was like a, a, a fake correspondence um, conducted by two... Ostensibly real people. Two fictional uh, characters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wait, uh, that's you and Christopher? Yeah. Are they fictional characters? No. We're, oh. Yeah. His guy oh. and his, his character... Um, Oh God! Because that's I, one of the what's one of those things that Pessoa was always trying to push that he himself he was, was he was, was also not of, real yeah. either. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I could read one of these. I guess I'll read a, a, a brief one. Um, is it, which is the one, the one about uh, about the the guy playing the is that there's not a Conklin poem playing the. Uh, Music at the baseball game, good enough for a baseball. Oh no, that's a song oh, that's lyric. Not, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. no, you don't have to do that. Yeah, there are also songs I about really baseball like in, in this book. Um, but um, read, no, read a Conklin poem. I'm sorry. Okay, I, let me let me find one. I don't want to don't um, want to distract you. Okay. Well, so he wrote a villanelle. I'm gonna. I mean, yeah. I mean, we both kind of 
read, read prose poems or pro like a list and a okay. So you so read, I'm going to read, read a, a, I'm going to read an actual villanelle now. Okay. This is this is me taking a big risk. Uh, this is the villanelle of the 500 team. Half my life I've given to this team. Like Stendhal, I'm in both red and black. To win by losing days, a vanished dream. I wish I'd saved the tickets to redeem, though never claim that I got nothing back for half my life now given to this team. Losing's every gambler's secret theme, roulette wheels all anchored to time's track. To win by losing days, a vanished dream. Wins and losses, a sort of tidal stream. I'd love to think I'm slightly in the black. Half my life I've given to this team. Losers, winners, all melded in my esteem. And in merciful Leith's waters, I've lost track. See, there's a, there's a trick. <laughs> Leith. Uh, to win by losing days, a Met fan's dream. Grapes overhead, I've declared sour cream. No bitterness to taste in winning's lack. Half my life I've given, given to this team to win by losing days, a lover's dream. Thank you. Now, I, I'm actually genuinely embarrassed to, to have read a, an actual a poem, poem, a rhyming poem. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, I, th I think this book is I got, a, I got one. partly about embarrassment for me. Well, I mean, I think it, it is a little bit of an embarrassing thing to suddenly um, claim that you, that you are in some way a poet. The the first Unless title for the book that I proposed to the publisher was um, Sylvester Stallone's paintings. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I know that there's one in here that has an actual form, but I, I spent the last section of this book basically thumbing my nose at Pessoa's final, and one of the only books he published was this kind of um, this book that was praising um, colonial uh, uh, explorers very unselfconsciously, and it, and it won praise from the Estado Novo, which was like the dictatorship that was in power at the time that he died. So it's a little bit um, ignominious, um, but I did. It's at the very end of of the anthology, and I kind of didn't get to it until then. And there's all, there's a strain of like thumbing my nose at colonialism throughout the book, but it, it just gets really sort of obvious here. Um, this is called Who's Sea? And it's a response to a Pessoa poem called Portuguese Sea. The sea is salty due to blood and sperm. Some blood is Portuguese, but subalterns hemorrhaged more and piled up like platelets. How many times, I wonder, must we state this? The jizz, it still appears on many faces, those subjugated by the paler races. The traders going AWOL from their families in search of spices acted as they damn pleased. Abandonment might spread Sodage's spores. Enslavement wiped out nations, started wars. Was it worth it? One might ask mankind, how did the soul grow smaller than the mind? So maybe we should let them oh, yeah. at us yes. uh, with questions, which doesn't mean that we're going to stop talking to each other, because I bet I'll hear you say things that I'll get interested in, and maybe like, the opposite. Yeah, yeah. But um, but we'd we'd love to handle some questions. Right. That would be nice. But but like not will you stop? Will you please leave? <laughs> will you that I'm not going to no. I I think we're not the we're not ushers allowed are to gonna the find ushers, you. That's the way this There's happens. there's one back there. Yeah, there were some hands. Yeah. yeah. That's a hand right there. Right. Hand, hand. <laughs> When you were in Lisbon, when you were in Lisbon, uh, did you get a chance to visit Pessoa's house? And if so, what did you think? No, I saw the the. Um, I mean, there's a little statue of him outside the uh, cafe where he used to write all the time, 
And you know, if you're, he's just kind of there a lot. If you if you know to look for him, there's like memorabilia everywhere, t-shirts and you know. But I no, I didn't make it to the house. I would love to see the trunk at some point. Apparently, like the majority of his work is a, a inside a big trunk, and it's just like scraps of paper. So I think pe editors really love the challenge of of you know combing through all of this material to see if there's an actual book anywhere in it. Um, people uh, consider his masterpiece to be this book called uh, The Book of Disquiet, which is, at, at one point I was reading something about it and the, the writer described it as a non-book <laughs> because it's, it's so sort of dispersed among all of these scraps of paper that, you know, and you can't quite tell, like, sometimes which heteronym is su it's supposed to have been written by. Um, but no, I didn't get a chance to do it. Well, so I, I have a trip to take. Hi. 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 It's a little weird. I feel like I was listening to a podcast. Now I have a microphone <laughs> in my hand. Um, I'm going to ask you both something that you've sort of already covered. I hope you'll forgive me for that. But you already mentioned that you were reading Pessoa and you felt this need to respond and then you saw the necklace and you're like, all right, there it is, I'm going to respond. But there's so many ways you could have and you both alluded to this sort of discomfort you felt coming out from like being novelists and now releasing these books of poetry. So I wanted to know like why this medium, what made you make that choice to like, I don't know, do something that made you uncomfortable? You first. Yeah, well, so, I mean, both of us uh, have or origin stories that include, I mean, I was, I thought I was gonna be a painter for a long time. So I, and I still, in a way, I'm very identified with that m moment, that disjunctive, you know, uh, jumping tracks when I, because I, I trained in high school, I went to a, a high school where I could, be a painter, I felt like an art student already by the time I got to college, and yet within months, something was changing, or I was changing something, and I, I, I realized I was at college and I was a fake art student who was secretly writing or wanting to write or trying to. So, and that that switch, um, and the sense that I was both abandoning things I was good at out of some imperative uh, and possibly embarrassing myself, which is something I already alluded to, and also possibly disappointing people, like specifically my dad, who was a painter, but also all the teachers who'd been patting me on the head for being a kind of little painting prodigy, that I was going to uh, do this thing that was going to expose me in a different way, because I wanted it, you know, um, it was a it was a legacy, so I didn't have to act like I wanted it to be a painter. Um, but I must really be wanting something or needing something by switching to to writing at all. And I'm still very identified with that moment of exposure, even if no one was interested, which at the time not that many people were. You know, uh, were compelled by my self constructions of any kind, but. They still mattered to me, and I think that, in a way, <clears throat> after, you know, James was was sort of funny. It was n nice hearing him say, "I don't think of you as a novelist, or I think of you as kind of other than a novelist, or more than a novelist." And I'm like, "I'm a novelist. I mean, that's most of what I spend my days on, and most of the pats on the head I've really gotten over the course of my adult life have been, you know, good novelist pats." And Mostly, it's awkward or, or embarrassing when the pat I on the head award. try to show some other face. And I think the poetry reconnects me to that sense of, of risk and embarrassment and also desire. Like, what do I want when I'm doing this thing that, you know, he must want something other than to do what he's good at and what we like him to do. And so what, what is that? So I'm, I'm, I'm very myself, in a way, doing them because it's so uncomfortable and new. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, let's see. Well, um, one, of, one of my 
things I like to do in in regard to Pilot Imposter is to go to bookstores and see if they have it and then see where they filed it. Because it's invariably something, you know, it's in a different place. Like it was in humor once, it was in um, art writing at another point, it was in essays. Um, I don't actually think I've seen it in poetry yet. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, I think what had happened to my thinking partially, aside from the fact that I'd already been sort of doing this kind of thing and feeling, you know, that thing that you don't get to feel as a novelist that you do get to feel, I think sometimes as a poet who is, you know, not super focused on nothing but poetry is a sense of accomplishment. Um, I, uh, I had a job, I still have this job actually, where um, I was co-teaching a class with three other teachers that lasted six hours at first, and then became, a, it's morphed a little bit. Um, and a lot of those teach, other teachers were poets, and um, I'm very impressionable. And it seemed to me after a while that I'd kind of absorbed an, a de facto MFA in poetry just by being in the room with all these people who are like really smart and really, you know, thoughtful and mindful even of, about, you know, poetry. Um, and so when I embarked on the project, I was already kind of thinking that it wasn't going to necessarily be poetry, even though it's poetry adjacent. Right? It's because it's about, you know, taking this text and, you know, just reacting to everything in the text, but not always poetically. So, I mean, there are some poems in it, but I guess I still get to say that I'm not technically a poet. Um, I I guess I just don't like to m define things. I mean, I've I've. I'm, I'm about to sing uh, That's Life. I've been a puppet, a pirate, a partner, a poet, a pawn, and a king. <laughs> I'm not going to do the whole thing. <laughs> I've been up and down and over and out. <laughs> you going to do like half of it? Well, I was waiting for you to pick it up. I actually can't. What? I can't join you on that. <sighs> Uh, the reason I know that is because uh, my mother used to work at a, a radio station in Westchester called WFAS that um, they played all of that old sort of um, kitschy um, stuff that Italian Americans really love, like Bola, the, all the Rat Pack stuff. So uh, like all of that is what like. What about Ah uh, uh, Shut Up of Your Face? Was that, did they oh, play that? Oh yeah. yeah, I, I haven't yeah. thought about I that like in that a long song. time, but I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? <laughs> not, not, will you leave? No. <laughs> okay. Um, oh wait, yeah. wait, wait for the. Is it on? Is it on? Oh, I guess I have to speak directly. Um, Carlotta's so lyrical. Was there a soundtrack that you were listening to while you were writing? And then same question for you, Jonathan, a little bit broader. Like, what is the music that you've been listening to recently? I cannot listen to music while I'm writing. I mean, that's not entirely true. I can listen to, like... Does anyone know this band, Illuvium? It's like very droney, very like, it's like nothing happening for a really long time. Like there was, a, there, I have been able to write while listening to stuff that like I don't have to think about while I'm listening to it, but I usually just, if I need to concentrate, I just, I put earplugs in actually, and I just like f try to focus on the thing I'm working on. Um, but I mean, it's influenced a lot by the kind of, like the kind of music that Carlotta would would have known, um, and you know, especially where that falls in my own life. Um, so, to call it lyrical, I think is almost literal. You it's like you mean that literally. And unlike some people, I actually asked for um, permission to to reprint some lyrics that I. Um, uh, put in the book, um, you know, so just did my due diligence. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, this is where 
I'm uh, James opposite. I listen to music while I write all the time. And um, <clears throat> there are times when it's better for it to be only instrumental music. But actually, I listen to music with lyrics while I write a lot, too. The, it's the case that actually, I think when I'm really committing language to the page, that I, in a way, there's like internal earplugs that come over and I, and I stop hearing whatever's going on. Because I also have sometimes like just a Mets game on the radio. But I, I know from, from losing track of the score that when I'm really writing, I'm not, I'm not hearing it. But I do think that these voices, you know, a lot of my writing is about cacophonies of voices. I mean, you know, it's this is different from like a Pessoa heteronyms thing, but I do think of my, my books as being at some level kind of um, the New York ones, especially, connected to a transliteration of a, a problem of listening to different registers, different idioms simultaneously on the street. Musics, voices, um, children and adults in an incongruent, you know, uh, kind of relation to language and reality. There's a, a great, great novel of New York uh, called Call It Sleep by uh, Henry Roth, where um, he literally has two, two different kinds of English for when the, the boy moves from inside the house to, to out onto the street. And you realize at some point in the book that they're speaking Yiddish inside the house and it's been translated into English and what this weird, almost caveman-like street language that the boy hears among the children is the way English sounds to a kid who is only speaking Yiddish inside the house and he's only learning English from the way children talk on the street. And um, this is one of my subject matters. So I think the fact that I allow a cacophony of music with lyrics and baseball games and NPR or whatever to kind of be present as like one track in my brain and I'm almost like fighting it out with that is maybe something native to my <laughs> self as well. You know, even before my writing, it's like basic to who I am. I'm surprised it's not 1010 wins. It has been that, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember writing short stories as a teenager to 1010 10 wins. <laughs> 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 Will you give us ten, 20 minutes? We'll give you the yeah. same, oh God, same that, story. That, you know, I used to think again. of that as the sound of people typing in the newsroom. And I thought <laughs> there was like a better typewriters that made that special sound from, from the promo on 1010 10 wins. Dun, 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 dun. I was like, I want mine to sound like that. Because that seemed like that was what it was supposed to be representing. Um, yeah, but also there's one other thing. I'm sorry, I'll just add to this reply very briefly, is that I also end up sometimes with talismanic songs that are uh, that are like a source code or a, or a, uh, what, what is it, a lodestone for the feeling in a given work. And I listen to them, you know, like when I was writing Girl and Landscape, it's a novel, five or six novels back, there was this John Cale song called Dying on the Vine that had this mysterious... Uh, power over me that, I mean, it, some of the lyrics were very literal. It was about a child's loss of a mother, which was a subject in my life and in this novel. But then other aspects of it were, as John Cale songs tend to be, kind of almost like a mashup or a cut up of different images that didn't have literal meaning. But they all seemed to be crucial to me, just puzzling over them. And so I play that song constantly to just make contact with that source for the book. Thanks for the question. So don't try that at home. <laughs> There's a hand. We're not allowed to say where. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. I think I, one of my favorite things about uh, novels in general, but also your novels, is sort of like the geographic specificity is sort of what you guys were talking about earlier. And I'm sort of wondering, um, particularly when you live in the place that you're writing about, um, how sort of like submerging yourself in this very, this lived in version of a place, um, but that is of a character changes your own relationship to that place. Um, 
for both. I'm from the Bay Area, so that's, I really love the Bay Area books. But yeah, just how sort of like embodying this other way of interacting with the place can change your own way of looking at it. Um, well, I mean, uh, my first two books take place in the South. Um, so uh, I thought that at some point I was going to have to come home in a sense. Um, but I didn't really want to, I resisted it because I felt like too many people, too many people were already doing that. Um, <laughs> no, nobody you would know, but, <laughs> but um, uh, with this one I, I realized that I had this like, very granular knowledge of this one place and that I could exploit as part of the book. Um, and, and it was, in fact, like much of the point of the book is about, you know, I ca and so I kind of walk around now looking at Brooklyn and I think, oh man, there should have been a scene here. Oh man, I should have done this. Or like, I go and I do something that, I mean, I'd done a lot of the things that Carlotta has, does in the book, but you know, there's the scene toward the end where she's on the F train and she's going over, um, going over the Smith and Ninth Street uh, station and you know you can see the the skyline of downtown Brooklyn, which is totally different than it was twenty like two years ago, let alone twenty. Um, and uh, you know I think I, I think sometimes about that, but mostly it's just like damn, I wish I could have done the whole borough. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I I have a obviously I have a, a really uh, rich connection to place in my writing. But I didn't write about New York for a long time. And I, I, I did write those Bay Area books while I was living there. But they were also, they're, they're kind of always a kind of rubbery, fantastical version of the Bay Area. You know, like in Gun With Occasional Music, there's no San Francisco. There's only Oakland. And it, it's never mentioned that there's anything <laughs> else. And, um, uh, for a while, I thought I could only uh, write about place in, uh, or write about New York City, especially indirectly. That it had to be allegorized, sort of, or made into a kind of a, a cartoon space. And then I had the weird experience of making up that character uh, in Motherless Brooklyn, who has Tourette syndrome. And one of the things is that he liked to touch everything. And I realized verbally, he he didn't want to be in a rubber space, a fake space. He wanted to touch real streets I knew and stores and you know real sandwiches I'd eaten from real delicatessens. And so I started naming things because he wanted to name them. And I felt very awkward about it. Like, this is nonfiction. Fiction is supposed to all be made up. I thought there was some law that the fiction police would arrest me if I said the real names of things. And then, he, but he insisted on it. And then I realized the power of that. And that has become a dedicated function of, you know, I mean, the next book, Fortress of Solitude, is all real names. It's like endlessly about, it's, you know, it's, it matters that it's Nevin's street, you know. But I didn't really do that with the Bay Area. I mean, you can recognize, if you know things, you can, oh, this is set in the Claremont Hotel, at the top of Ashby. You know, it's kind of cute, a couple of little gestures. But I don't really embed the writing in the space, the urban space, the way I, did, I learned to do, I had to learn to do with Brooklyn. So that changed. Yeah, you're sort of reminding me of one of the things I tell my students. I think I'd said this like last week to somebody who was, uh, people have this tendency to talk about writing as if it is the same as this, you know, like lived experience. And it's so bizarre to me. My favorite thing is when people, you know, somebody has written a character who is based on a real person and that real person knows about it and they point at the book and they're like, I'm in that book. I'm like, no, actually, there's a bunch of words on a page, and you're, you're right there. Um, and I think the thing that I, that I often try to tell people is like, you know, um, uh, this thing that I can't remember now all of a sudden. Um, just that, the, you know, that, that uh, lived experience, as soon as you start telling a story, you start lying. Right, as soon as, even if you're telling a story about yourself, actually sometimes especially if you're telling a story about yourself, you're shaping the way that people are going to see you when they read this thing. Um, 
you're, you know, you, so, which is the same thing as creating a character, right? Like you're leaving things out. You're going to have to leave things out because it's really impossible to capture all of the, I mean, this room is fairly quiet and calm, but like if you're, you know, walking around a New York street, there's really no way to, to um, hardly even in film can you do it because, you know, you have like 360 degree, maybe at some point someone will create this. Uh, like a 360 degree film that you can just be in. I guess virtual reality is supposed to be kind of like that, but it doesn't really. Uh, um, I don't think so. right. Wait, there's a hand over there. Yeah, it's, on the oh, it's attached to a person. Look. Um, when you say 360 degree, I'm thinking immersive experience. And, right. Um, I can't speak for either of you or anyone in this room, but it seems like we're all kind of re-emerging from this COVID experience. And this is amazing to see you up on the stage, have this shared experience um, for the first time in a while, or maybe the second or third time. But if you're coming to Los Angeles and you're looking for this immersive experience, which I think both of your writing really, really suggests, um, are there plans? in this town where you can't wait to go and say, oh, I can't wait to go to uh, Skylight Books on Vermont or wherever, because I'm really excited to get back into a more immersive literary experience that includes other people other than just flipping through a book, you know, in... Are you talking about land landmarks or... What sort of um, spots in this town um, inspire you. Um, but when you say spots, do you mean like bookstores or really spots? Like you know that right. really encourage the kind of um, um, you you aspect sort of, of you kind of live here more. Than yeah, I so I, I'm so a I'm, I'm a New Yorker who's for over a decade I've been living on the edge of Los Angeles in Claremont because of teaching at Pomona College, and. You know, one reason I haven't seen James in, in Brooklyn is not just pandemic uh, uh, situations, but, but that I don't manage to get to New York City very often. I mean, I, I've, I've been writing about it for, again for the last few years, but it's a kind of dreaming my way back into a space that I'm, you know, a combination of denied or restricted from by circumstance. And I've, I've sort of banished myself, you know? I mean, if I'd been intent on staying in Brooklyn somehow forever. I probably could have done that, but I was really ambivalent about my last life in New York City in some ways. And, I, and I, I've, I've lived more of my adult life in California now than, than on the East Coast, which is kind of weird for me to think. But, um, but at the same time, Claremont, you, it's funny you talk about wanting to get to LA because you're, you're, you're journeying here. I mean, two days ago, James and I just went and did some stuff like in Koreatown. We, we blundered into a, re a hole in the wall restaurant and then went to a very a cool kind of boba tea place. And we just had our feet on the ground in LA in a way that I almost never do. Claremont is like living, it's like the Midwest of Los Angeles. It's, I don't know, it's a kind of a, it's also like a Truman Show city. It's just a perfect little fake college town on the edge of the desert. It has nothing to do with this. So I come here, for a, you know, an a, an errand, and first of all, it's a fucking schlep, but but then I'm Thank like you. in a different space, you know. I don't live in in Los Angeles in the sense that when I live in New York City, I live in New York City. I live in a strange, in, interesting in some ways, but also quite antiseptic um, or static. I think that's more the word for Claremont, uh, uh, college town, that just happens to be adjacent to Los Angeles. So I come here and I'm like a rube from the sticks. I just, I'm like, they got a really big museum. <laughs> you know, it's all very, it's really impressive. And, and, I, and I, I still remain connected to my own New York version of like, LA is hard to figure out. And I don't just mean like how to get from place to place, but also what it signifies, the different spaces and how they interlock or, or you know, relate or don't relate, because some of it's like you throw up your hands. Um, you know, we're all, I'll, I'll be called out to some 
place that I didn't know existed really. Atwater Village, wait, what's this? You know, like it's a whole specific thing. And it, you know, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have a very replenishable naivete about LA. That is, that's interesting to me. You know, I once kind of faked a book about Silver Lake, but I did that totally by uh, transposing the, um, the Mission District in San Francisco. I just wrote about my life on Guerrero Street and pretended it was <laughs> Silver Lake. So I don't, I don't really know anything about LA. <laughs> um, I don't either, um, but it seems the, the phenomenon I'm a little bit baffled by is like, it's, it seems like sort of the Hollywood area, which I seem to keep ending up in every time I visit, um, has only just discovered the rooftop. I feel like when I would come here and walk around, the buildings are like two floors high, most of them. And then I'd be like, somebody should put a roof deck on that. And then you could see like every, but nobody has been really doing it. <laughs> and so now finally there's like a couple of places like in, in that seem to have rooftops. Um, and the views are spectacular as you would expect. Um, I feel I, I, I'm, I'm one of, I, I, I feel like I was, you were asking for tips or something, but I'm <laughs> just like, well, Griffith Observatory, that's a really nice spot, or the Getty Museum, that seems great. Um, or how about the Hammer Museum, that would be fun to visit. <laughs> we, we, you just reminded me that like the second or third time we hung out was on a rooftop in Austin, Texas, at that party. Oh, that party. Can you be a little There's like specific? several levels of gaudy rooms and then you get to the roof and there's a pool. Oh, Opal Divine. Yes. That's no longer there. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I was I was there for the Texas Book Festival. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was I couldn't even remember the name of it. I had to like text somebody from back then and be like, it had began with an O. What was it called? It was Opal Divines. Yeah, it was very maze like. And then they opened a second one that I think also is gone. So we're definitely back to where we started, which is talking gnomically between ourselves, as if no, there's no one else here. Um, maybe we're I, I quite, one, quite near the end. Maybe like one, one, one or hand. two more at the most. Yeah. Um, do, do, oh, OK, it's on. Uh, do we get more Carlotta? Um, is there such a thing? Th it's possible, um, but I, I'm, it's been optioned. But I can't really say much more than that. But I mean, as far as her... From me? From I don't you. know. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Read it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> you liked it. I know you liked it. <laughs> Is that it? I guess so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.